chapter 2, uh, verse 3. He is recording, of course, this phenomenal event of the outpouring of the Spirit, which is the ushering in for us of the new covenant. So everything the Old Testament has been wanting to accomplish now, it is full-blown and it is happening in this event. And this is on the initial outpouring of what's going to continue to happen and is happening now even today in your life and mine. He begins with the content, the context, which is in verse 1, and he lays it out that this happened on the feast day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish holiday. He gives you the atmosphere, the aroma in which this took place, and it took place in this together with heavy breathing kind of thing that we talked about uh, last night. Then he moves into the content, which is verse 2 and 3. And the content is imagery. He's giving imagery. It's Old Testament imagery. How do you describe what can't be described? How do you tell what can't be told? How do you talk about what can't be talked about? The fullness of God. I mean, the very nature and heart of the person of God is actually coming to indwell the human being. How on earth do you talk about that? And he goes back to the Old Testament imagery that they would be familiar with. And in verse 2, you'll notice he talks about, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So he uses the wind imagery. There was no wind. He definitely states that. It was as of a rushing mighty wind. If there had been actual wind, we would have explained it all away and said, oh, tornado came by. So it didn't mean anything. But it was the sound of all of that without any of the effects. He's trying to give you Old Testament imagery of what it's like for God to come and live within you and just literally breathe in your life. He does the same thing in verse 3, which we want to deal with. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. It's the Old Testament imagery of fire. You know that that obviously stands for the person of God. There was the fire on the altar that was continually burning. There's the burning bush that, was, that did not consume the bush and yet spoke to Moses. There's the, there's the fire that came down on Mount Sinai, lightning, dark cloud, uh, flashes. It was all taking place. It's the imagery of fire. It, it obviously, as he's referring and, and taking us and focusing us, focusing us on the person of God himself. But there was no fire. It's as of fire. So he gives this imagery that this thing came into the room and the only way he knows how to describe this thing is in terms of the fire. And it's separated and went over and sat on each of them. Again, it's imagery of what it is to have the fullness of God come and live within you. It's phenomenal imagery. Now, out of all the words he could have picked to, to uh, describe this, he uses this idea of sat. Do you notice it's the heart of the verse as you look at verse 3? There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat. One what? The divided tongues. By the way, I, in the old King James, that was uh, cloven tongues, uh, which is an interesting statement, uh, as of fire, but, and, and, it, and it divided up. And here it comes and sat. It sat on each of them. So the sitting idea becomes the dominant thought process of, the very, of verse 3. As he begins to describe what, taking, what is taking place, he's talking about coming and sitting on the individual. Now, there are lots of words, uh, Greek words, that could have been used for sitting. There's the normal word where you come in and plop in your chair. That's not the word he's using. There's other words that could have been used. The abide idea, like I am the vine, you are the branch, and abide in me. That resting, abiding kind of concept, that would have been a great word for here. He didn't use that. The word he used is very significant. It's used 46 times in the New Testament. And every single time, well, you can argue about a couple. But in every single time, well, eliminate them. In 44 of those times, it's really significant that it always describes a person of great authority coming to sit in a place of great authority. Every time. It's attached to that. Did you get it? A person of great authority who is now coming to sit in a place of great authority. That's the connection of this word, sat or sit. Now, it doesn't take much to prove that to you. We can walk through the 44 if you'd like. Uh, but let's just stay in the book of Acts. For instance, just to give you some examples, if you stay right in the book of Acts and you go back to chapter 25, 
you will find this verse. It's a guy by the name of Festus. Festus is a king. Paul has been called in. The Jews are after him again. He's drug in before the court. Festus, the king, comes, and it says in verse 6, and when he had, chapter 25, verse 6, when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting, that's our word, on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought to him. A king sitting on a judgment seat. Person of great authority who's sitting in a place of great authority. Now, it's very easy. If you turn to chapter 12 of the book of Acts, you'll find the same thing. Only this time, it's a guy by the name of Herod. Again, Paul's in trouble, drug in before the courts. And as he's, the Jews are after him. And as he comes in, in verse chapter uh, 12, verse 21, it says, On a set day, Herod, the king, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne. Same word, our word. Same identical word. Again, person of great authority who's come to sit in a place of great authority. Now, what's really interesting, and we could go on and on, but what's really interesting in the usage of this word that in, contained within the 46 times this word is used, meaning a person of great authority who's sitting in a place of great authority, this word is used exclusively. I mean, like every single time. I mean... No argument. This is the word that's always used when, when Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Woo! That's phenomenal. Every single time. Not some of the time, not once in a while. Every single time. This is the word that's used. It's a person of great, of great authority who's come to sit in a place of great authority. And you can just walk through it. Stay right in uh, Acts again, and I'll give you an example. Go down to verse 30 of this very chapter chapter 2. He says, therefore, Peter is preaching, therefore being a prophet, talking about David, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. That's our word. Person of great authority, referring to Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father over the, and being king over the entire kingdom. Now, I don't want you to turn there, but this is just everywhere in the Scripture. Every time you see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, this word is the word that's used. It just, it, and it's all over the book of Hebrews. Listen to this verse in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's, or the Hebrew writer has written seven chapters, comes to chapter 8, verse 1, and says, I've harassed you for seven chapters. What am I trying to say? He said, here it is. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated. Our word, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Let me give you another one in Hebrew. Chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And we could go on and on and on. So what do you got? You've got this phenomenal picture going on. Out of all the words he could have used to describe Jesus coming to live within you, you know what word he chooses to use? Sat. And not just any sitting, it's the person of great authority who's literally come to sit in a place of great authority. And he parallels, he's setting up a parallel. This is mind-boggling, you've got to get this. He's setting up a parallel. He says, let me tell you, as the physically raised from the dead Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father and sits at the right hand of the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords, at that very moment that that happens, guess what took place? The spirit of that Jesus descended to the earthlies and sat on you as king of king and lord of lords. And a parallel is established. Physically raised from the dead, Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father. Trumpets are blowing. Coronation ceremony. Angels are gathering in. Everyone's praising. Jesus is lord and king. At that very moment, you know what took place? That spirit, the spirit of that Jesus descended to the earthlies and sat on the believer and, whoa, angels are floating around. 
trumpets are blowing, coronation ceremony. He is crowned king in your life. Parallel. That's really interesting to me. Because if you've been around the evangelical church, the emphasis of the fullness of the Spirit is power. I got the power. Isn't it interesting? This emphasis is not on power. This is if emphasis is on reigning. This is not about miracles. This is about, oh, I'm Lord of your life. Sat on me. Very significant. Very significant. Now you say, well, that, that's good theology. It's a radical idea. But it, it, it's good theology, it sounds good, but let's get practical. What does that mean? Okay, let's get down and dirty. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. There appeared to them divided tongues. The word divided obviously meaning separated, fell apart, torn apart. Obviously what he's describing is this thing came into a room. Whatever it looked like, however you picture it in your mind, it's okay with me. And it came into the room, and it's like tongues of fire. And that one unit broke into, obviously, 120 parts. And one piece of that went over and sat on every single individual believer. Now, did that actually happen? Did they actually see? Is it imagery? Don't care. Don't get off on that. This is the whole point. He's trying to tell you something. Now, you'll note that in verse 2, it's a corporate filling. It came and filled the whole house. But in, in verse 3, it's an individual filling, which is very significant in the passage because he's moving from the corporate idea to the individual idea, which has to be done. See, I've been waiting around the church, waiting for God to fall, brother, waiting for the revival to happen, waiting for the movement of the Spirit to take place. Well, why isn't it taking place? Why don't we have a corporate filling? Why doesn't God come and just sweep us all off his, uh, our feet? Why isn't God? Well, because oh, there's hypocrites in the church, bless God. And when the hypocrites in the church get right and we all get, and then he'll come and we'll have a, okay, so we're waiting on the hypocrites. Well, who's the hypocrite? Well, obviously it's not me, it must be you. So we get rid of you, and now we're still waiting for the falling. Well, it still hasn't happened. It must be you. Got rid of you. Now we're still waiting. And, well, who is it? We're down to my wife and my now, myself now. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. So he says, quit that. If we have to wait till the church gets straightened out, if we have to wait till all the hypocrites go away or get saved, if we have to wait till everybody, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm tired of waiting on you. I'm not going to wait anymore, man. He says, let's move into verse 3, which is an individual, hey, set on me. So regardless of what you do or where you go or what you are, I, hey, how about Jesus? How about me? Would you sit on me? That's significant. <clears throat> now, I, I don't know how you picture Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Uh, I can tell you what you've taught me as a church, what you've taught me through the years. You've taught me that Jesus physically raised from the dead. Physically raised from the dead. And I said to you, well, probably not. He probably spiritually raised from the dead. You, you said, no, 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 no. You go, into the, uh, uh, you go into the tomb, and you go over and you uh, take these grave clothes that look like there's something in them. You poke them, and they go flat. Why? Because there's no body in there. Well, what happened to the body? It didn't rot. It disappeared because it was physically, the body was physically raised. And that the disciples saw him for 40 solid days and whacked him on the back, and their hand didn't go through. Jesus passed through the walls and sat down at the table and ate. Well, how could you eat and still pass through walls? Oh, watch Star Trek. So, hey, there's no problem with that. <laughs> Anyhow, however that is, here he is. He's got this physical body. He, we saw him get up in the morning with his hair all messed 
stuff. Hey, we, 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 his morning breath. We watched him brush his teeth. We traveled with him. Hey, we went. He, this is a physical raised from the dead Jesus. In fact, we physically watched him ascend. Oh, there he goes. Oop, behind that cloud. And he's gone, physically raised from the dead and physically ascended. That's what you taught me. In fact, you were so strong on this, you said, guess what? One day, he, physical Jesus, raised from the dead, is going to come back and we're going to say, whoa! Got the wart on his big toe just like you always had. And that he's going to come back physically. So he, he, he ascended, raised from the dead, ascended physically. He's coming back physically. Well, duh, does that mean he's physical now? So how do you picture that? Here's God the Father. You can't see him. In fact, Horton Wiley, this was the uh, three volumes that are over there on the shelf. Nobody wants to read them anymore. But he was Mr. Theologian of the Church of the Nazarene back in the 1700s when I was coming up. So, hey, we all studied his book by candlelight and, and uh, before the fireplace, you know, Abraham Lincoln style. So uh, we all, we and right in the middle of his theology book, he says, he says this. He says, if you make it to heaven, the only God you'll ever see is Jesus. You're not going to see God the Father. He's spirit. You can't see him. Holy Spirit, obviously spirit. You can't see him. The only one who's got a body is Jesus. So here he is, he's sitting. Here's God the Father, you can't see him. Here's Jesus and he's sitting. Well, if he's got a physical body, then he has to have a throne. Oh, he's got one right by the right hand of the Father. And he's sitting. Now picture the throne the way you want to. Gold plated, diamonds, whatever you like. Help yourself. There it all is. And Jesus is sitting there. Now get this concept. The emphasis of the concept that he's giving us is not on Jesus is king over the throne. He is. It's his throne. I understand that. That concept is there. But that's not the emphasis. But it's there. In other words, Jesus can look at his throne and say, hey, legs too long, cut them off. Hey, thank you, it's better. Hey, I want more cushions on my throne. He can have his throne any way he wants it. Why? He's Lord, King, Boss of the throne. We all understand that. That certainly is there. He is king, it's his throne. We got it. But that's not the concept here. The concept here is not he's Lord over the throne. The concept is he's sitting on the throne and he's ruling from the throne. So it's not he's Lord over, it's he's Lord from the throne. In other words, the throne has become the platform by which he is administrating and flowing his divine authority into the world. That's the concept. Now bring all that into the passage. What have you got? Oh! <gasps> as the physically raised from the dead Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and sat on his throne. He's Lord over the throne. We understand that. But he's sitting on the throne and administrating as King of kings and Lord of lords from the throne. At that very moment, the spirit of that Jesus descended to the earth and sat on me. Now, is he Lord over me? Yes. That concept's there. Is he my boss? Yes. Should I do what he says? Yes. That's not the concept. Of the passage. The concept of the passage is, oh, he's sitting on me. Why? I am the throne from which he's going to administrate his authority into my world. Now, if he's just Lord over me, and I got to shape up, get my act together, good night, okay. Well, I don't want to go to hell. All right. But if he's not Lord just over me, if he's Lord from me, if he's see, I become an avenue through which he begins to administrate the divine action of his being in my world. See, if he's Lord over me, well, I'm obligated. You know, he died for me. I owe him big time. But if he's not just Lord over me, if he's Lord from me, if he's literally sitting on me and administrating, flowing his authority and power into my world, wow, I'm participating in the heart of God. That's a whole new deal. 
describing what's going on when God comes to live within you. That he hasn't just come to boss you around. He's come to sit on you and to administrate his kingdom through you. And literally your life becomes the flowing resource of the action of God in your world. Now, what what would that mean? Well, he develops it in the passage and says, what that means is you can expect that there will be impossible kind of stuff beginning to take place. In fact, you're going to get so used to it that this impossible kind of stuff is going to take place and you're going to say, And you used to go, whoa! Now you're going. (laughs) Because it's normal for you. (gasps) You're talking about miracles. I've never done a miracle. How many miracles have you done? Walked on the water lady. We'll come and watch. (laughs) Ooh, we thought. I got interested in the miracle thing. Don't want to go deep with it. But in studying the book of Acts, do you know that nobody did miracles in the book of Acts except apostles and two deacons? Three thousand got saved at Pentecost Day. I know. Five thousand men got saved after Peter got done preaching. I know. That's eight thousand just right there, and none of them did miracles. Only the apostles and two deacons. And all this time I've been beating myself over the head saying, I, I should be doing miracles. Psst, uh, didn't work. Psst, uh, didn't work. Maybe miracles is not the big deal. Well, you're talking about doing impossible stuff. I know, I know. And they did do impossible stuff. Well, then that, that should be a miracle. No. What are you talking about? I could go on for hours with this, but Uh, Let's give you an example. Uh, Have you ever tried to love everybody? It is impossible. Because there's some people you just don't like. And I'd rather talk about you than me. Yeah, there's some people I just don't like. Can't help it, didn't like them when I saw them, don't like them now. Just don't like them. I have developed to the place where I can tolerate anybody. You sit on this side, I'll sit on this side. I can tolerate, but love, pour my life out, embrace, it's impossible. Are you that way? Nod your head. So how do you handle people you don't like? Stay away from them. And cluster around yourself only people that you like. Therefore, you can say, I love everybody. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's called a clique. Oh, no, it's called the church. stretch this out but we'll cut it short wouldn't it be interesting if Jesus would come and sit on me and do something impossible through me like love everybody (laughs) that's impossible no that's a miracle that beat stretching your arm short leg beats that let me give you another living above sin what's well, impossible if you tried it's absolutely possible not sin I know 
Temptation is, I know. The world is, I understand. Too many circumstances, I know. Circumstances are everywhere. It's impossible to live above sin. Oh, cut it short, manly. Okay, wouldn't it be interesting if Jesus would come and sit on you and do something impossible through you, like live a pure life? That's impossible! <laughs> That's what he's talking about. I was discussing with uh, a friend of mine who was a plant manager. Uh, quality control, you know, and, uh, production and assembly line and all that stuff. He's it, all that. And as we were discussing that and the church and this and this kind of a, con in this kind of a context, he came up with the phrase, he said, he called it dumbing down. I said, what on earth is that? Well, he said dumbing down in manufacturing world means that you have, you're making this product and you want this quality of you want this quality. You've got a quality control. They inspect the product, and you want to meet this quality. It has to meet this standard right here. And we build, and we build, and we build. And finally, we're at, in expecting all these, we, we don't meet this quality. We're supposed to, but we never, quite, we never come to that quality. We never make that standard. So he said, what we do is, yay, we made the quality. <laughs> And we dumb down. I can't love everybody. I know. Yay! <laughs> Not an interesting concept. Oh, the Pharisees are awful at that. Because they absolutely knew they couldn't keep all the laws. So they selected, they developed 613 of their own, which was an adjustment of the real law of God, and they made it into 613 of their own little laws that they felt like they could keep. But even then, they couldn't keep all 613 because there's so many of them, and they couldn't get, they wrapped their mind, and get, they just couldn't consistently do that. So they begin to argue, well, well, at least we should keep the most important ones. What's the most important law? So they had these big arguments about which is the most important, and what are they doing? Dumbing down. Well, I'll tell you, bless God, at least I don't cheat on my wife. Well, yay. <laughs> We've done that, folks. See, what he's describing is a whole different ball game. What he's describing is, oh, God is going to come and sit on me. And I'm going to become a platform for the divine action of God himself who's going to produce through me impossible kinds of stuff. Wow. Well, what's my part in this? Try real hard. Grit your teeth. Count to ten. Get your act together. Shape up. And give me $50. Wow. I'm just a chair. Jesus. I'm guilty. I'm worse than a rotten banana. I'm guilty. I've dumbed down. I've excused. I blame my background. I blame the way I was raised. I blame the circumstances around me. I blame my family. I blame my lack of knowledge. Lord, I've had dozens of excuses. Man, I'm so guilty of this. I've dumbed down. You come along with this big standard, and I look at you, God, and say, hey, bug off. I can't. I'm not adequate. I can't pull that off. 
And all the time you wanted to sit on me. You wanted me to become the throne upon which you dwelt and you would begin to act actively flow who you are in and through my life. And that the whole design you had all the time was for me just to be yours. And I, want, I beg you today, in the name of Jesus, I beg you today, would you, oh, in the name of Jesus, would you please, would you please forgive me for all my dumbing down, for all my excuses, for all my compromises, for all the times I... Oh, in the name of Jesus, would you, would you do a brand new thing in me, in us? Would you sit on us afresh and anew? Could it be like it took place just now? Could it be like you have just descended from the heavenlies and you've just come to sit on? Would you make us your throne? Heads are bowed. This is not a finger in your face. This is not a bawling out. This is not put you in your place. This is not make you feel guilty. This is not condemnation. This is not any of that. This is, folks, do you know what we got a hold of here? Do you know what the possibilities are? Do you understand that in the midst of our home situation, we could march back into our home and we could literally, oh, Jesus would sit on us and flow through us that would literally revolutionize, I mean, the impossible kinds of stuff that could take place. Do you realize what could happen down at our workforce? Do you realize what could take place in our, do you realize what this town, the effect it would have on this town, your town, our town? Do you realize what it would do to the church? Do you realize what our lives, do you realize the hope of what we, folks, you can be what you ought to be. You can live like you ought to live. Come on, there is the quality can be matched. There is the, the provision has been made. He wants to sit on you. Would you let him? Would you let him? Would you come out of your struggling? Would you come out of your trying? Would you let him? Would you come out of your effort? Would you come out of all that would blockade? Jesus, I want to set aside my excusing. I want to set aside my rationalization. I want to set aside all the things that seemingly hindered me. And I just want you to come and sit on me. Altars open. Ah, moments of secrecy. Moments of secrecy. Here we are, Jesus. Descend, oh, descend. Descend on us.